Stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are actor, director, Paul Kampf, and photographer, artist, Gerald Incandela. And you see his work on the set. We'll see more of it later. Actor, director, Paul Kampf grew up in northern Minnesota earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Acting and Directing at the University of Minnesota in Duluth, then went on to Illinois State University for his Master's in Acting. You've seen him in films and on the stage, and let's say you love to write. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Paul, yeah, yeah. welcome. Thank you, thank you, great to be here. You've written lots of screenplays. I, yeah, I, I have uh, written a lot of screenplays and um, came out of writing a lot of theater first and then, back, and then into screenplays, so it's nice to go back to the theater. When you finished school, where did you go? How did you get started in your career? I, uh, <coughs> I finished graduate school and during graduate school I started a company, uh, Breadline. Uh, you started that then, Breadline? Yeah, I started in uh, 1993 with two other uh, gentlemen, two great guys, and um, we just started this theater and it grew and grew and grew. Oh, so t what do they do? Yeah. Well, Breadline, what, Breadline, what we do is um, we focus on world premiere theater. So we've done almost 30 productions uh, since 1993. But not necessarily written by you or your partners. Um, some, a lot of them have been, but we've worked with a lot of other writers and a lot of other artists. But um, we started the company and we grew and we moved to Chicago and built a, a, a great thing there. and So you lived in Chicago. Yeah. Fantastic theater, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. Twelve years I lived there. Did you did you work there acting? Yeah, uh, yeah, in the theater um, as well as other work that came through Chicago, but it was mostly theater. It's a very theater center town. I so, know. Yeah. yeah, and then I uh, ended up directing a film from <clears throat> there and that's how I got out to LA. You directed American Gothic. Yeah. What was that story? Boy, it's a story of um, three brothers who uh, come together over uh, circumstances of their their uh, father's death. It's and on stage. Is it's what on we're talking about. Yeah, it was and on then stage. Then it goes. Okay. Yeah, go it was on. on stage, and we did that uh, production uh, for a long time, probably four months. Uh, it was a very successful play, and then I adapted it to the screen and ended up directing the film version. And yeah. then the film came out, yeah. and that was all through Breadline. Yeah, through Breadline, went out and found the private funding and did the independent film route. Yeah. And then the other film, From Grace, yeah. let's talk about that too. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a project that um, uh, started out as a little, pro a little short idea and I uh, developed it for a group of acting students that I work with and it blossomed and I found uh, that it was time to make this into a movie. So we just finished it um, finally about a month ago. So that was the same situation? Yeah. Stage to, to film? No, that was completely for film. For, completely? Yeah. Is, is the transition from stage to film easy or difficult? Uh, from a writing point of view? Um, from both. Both, because, boy. <laughs> you know, I see a stage play and yeah. I, how could that ever be a film? Uh, yeah, I do think that, um, I do think it's really hard from a writing <clears throat> point of view from stage to screen because it's a language uh, medium on stage and it's about people in a confined environment. And emotion. And emotion. And but you're feeling, right? Yeah, right, right. And on screen, <laughs> you have to move the story along. So I, I've, uh, you know, I've adapted the play and, and made the movie. I don't think I would be so excited about adapting theater to film again because it's its own, it's its own beast. What about the other way around? Uh, I hate to see films on the stage. Well, you're, you're, <laughs> you're hitting something that is a sort of a sore spot. I don't like seeing uh, films taken to the stage because I do think that um, it's such a defined idea of what it is when it's a film, and, and oftentimes you don't get interpretation uh, when you're back on the stage. So I think it's, uh, I mean, of course there's great adapta adaptations yeah. to some films, but I do think it's, 
it's kind of backwards, you know. To me, it's always been backwards yeah, yeah. because I guess if you're a theater person right. and you like the stage, uh, they're yeah. two different mediums right. to me. Absolutely. You're the artistic director. Yeah, yeah. So what what do you do besides all this filming, <laughs> acting, <laughs> writing? Um, what else is your job as artistic director? Um, at this point, as as it's transitioned and developing into film as well, is really uh, the producing aspect, which is, is finding in, you know, equity, uh, as everyone knows, find private investors and looking for the right people and projects to come together. So How did you learn to do that? Uh, I guess through through the process of starting a small theater, um, it was the sometimes the best training, the little failures you have and you realize that everything in film is just, it's really the same thing, it's just a different scale. But yeah. you have to ask for money. Well, yeah, you, you didn't do. Have, when you're an actor, you yeah. don't have to. Well, in a different way. In a different way, yeah. yeah. <coughs> I think that, um, uh, I think that's <coughs> been the hardest Part That's is what that I as, want. you know, when you feel you're an artist and you believe in what you do, but it's sort of um, been a really good balance of saying, you know, I believe in this and this is why we should do it. And you just have to honestly look at the risk reward for the investor and take it from there. When it, you built a performing arts center in Chicago, yeah. How we, big is it? It was, um, boy, the, the, about a 10,000 square foot facility. Oh, yeah. it was pretty big. And yeah. then you also did summer rep, your yeah. group? Yeah, back uh, in the beginning we did a whole summer repertory. So do you still have that Performing Arts Center or you rent it out? Or no, when happened? we left Chicago the um, the building I think is converted to condos now. Oh, so you're co totally gone from totally Chicago? Totally gone, yeah. We came, it was an intersection of, of the building owner selling the facility and oh. and the film I was making so it became the great impetus to move So out. was this better here for film for you? Oh yeah, film, uh, you know, uh, film this is it, right? Now Will I, that be how you'll be going then, I'm more than theater? I think that it's uh, it's going to be kind of a hopefully a good hybrid. Um, uh, hopefully a couple projects a year in film and at least one or two in theater. In in your group, yeah. you have the, you have actors from all over. How yeah. do they find you? Um, some people know what I was doing in Chicago. Um, I, I uh, got out here when I was directing and I was asked to teach. I was doing a lot of uh, master classes and acting and it sort of became in this In a magnet. certain place? At a certain theater? Um, I was teaching um, just uh, being asked to come into various places and then I started <coughs> essentially my own program so I use a space in Hollywood Momentum Theater. I see. And uh, I, I have a couple classes and a lot of private students. But um, So that's, that's how they say, but, but yeah. it's a d diversity, yeah. your group of actors. Right. They work in, you know, we work on film technique, we work on stage, and my focus is to try to help people find that bridge emotionally, how you bring the emotion from the stage onto screen and how you, how you expand and contract that. Yeah. They're culturally different, too, your yeah, students. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it seemed like just the span of cultural yeah. differences. How do you pull them all together, or do you just let them um, draw from their own uh, cultural background. Yeah, I really focus on exactly that, that, that you know, an actor is an individual artist and you have to help them find their voice and hopefully give them, you know, technique <laughs> that draws who they are. Um, it's a hard business, as you know. It's so, very difficult. Yeah. I don't know. Let's talk about your play that's yeah, yeah. at the Odyssey right yeah, yeah. now, 11 September. Yeah. I have the... Um, Beautiful. Card here. It is great. It's yeah. beautiful. Who yeah. did this work? Uh, a wonderful designer named Steve Shaw or uh, uh, Greg Shaw, excuse me. Uh, it's really it's beautiful, beautiful yeah, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, so it's a. You're directing it. No, I'm, oh, I'm in. I wrote in it. it. Yeah. You wrote it, and and uh, who's the director? That's what uh, I meant G to say. Gita Donovan is the director, a wonderful director who was uh, directed out of New York for many many years. But this is the thing. Mm -hmm. You're acting in it. Yeah. You're saying your own words. Yeah. And you're being directed by someone yeah. else who really didn't write your words right. or know about it. How, do, how does that feel? How does it work? Um, great. Uh, you know, it's, it's something that has happened a lot in the past. And so I think that what I've learned very honestly is that a writer really doesn't know what they've written until they're in rehearsal. Oh, and, is that right? And that you have to get into that process and say, well, I have to figure out why I'm saying this and what I'm doing. And I think oftentimes what you think you wrote is very different than what you well, did. Well, does she interpret it differently than what you wrote it? Uh, Obviously. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we. I think there's a lot of things that, that um, we we clearly agree on from writing and, and directing, but there's a lot of, to me, that's the joy of it. It's that conflict of figuring out what it will be in front of an audience versus what it is in your room when you when you write a script, yeah. Well, that's what I was thinking. Like, yeah. how could, she's telling you to say something one way, and I'm thinking, oh, yeah. my gosh. Yeah. I think Paul's <laughs> thinking something yeah, else. Yeah. Yeah. What happens with that? that, that, that is, it? You know, it has <coughs> happened. You know, it, it, it's, it's, I, I would say it's as, for me as much of a, 
in some ways a, of a, a conflict if, if I'm playing Shakespeare and someone's saying, you know, this is what I think this scene is about. I have my interpretation have theirs, theirs right. and then somewhere one of us is is having to figure out how we can get that. So um, yeah, but Shakespeare's not on stage you're right. doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the difference. Yeah, yeah. Myself. Did you you? It's a two person yeah, play, yeah. and you play with Liz Rebert. Yeah. And did you write it for her? I didn't. I wrote it, and she auditioned for the the play. And I had I knew I knew Liz because she had studied with me, and then oh. she um, did a she was a lead in one of the films I directed, and she auditioned and. Uh, did a fabulous uh, audition, and, and the casting director loved her, and here oh, we so go. Oh, so that's, how, that's yeah, yeah. how it happened? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah. okay, now tell me the story. Boy, it's a story of fate and coincidence. It's about two strangers that, it's about a man who comes to New York to speak about 9-11. Uh, he's a mathematician to speak at a conference and meets this younger woman, uh, which what seems to be sort of a one-night stand fling, and then as the play unfolds, you realize that there's a, an immense amount of circumstances have led for these two people to meet. So it's a parallel between all of the circumstances that had to play out for, for unfortunately, 9-11 to take yeah. place, the impossible coincidences that needed to happen, and, and, and how these two people have essentially, it's either fate that they met, or it's, or it's, uh, or it's, it's um, complete coincidence, and that's what the audience has to sort of wrestle with, is what are our own truths? But as being a mathematician, yeah. It's, it, that person doesn't take fate. Absolutely. That's, you're right. So, so the character I play is someone who is, everything is intellectual. Everything is about looking at chaos theory and distance from things. And <laughs> How what, did you know that? How did you research all that? Um, it's something I knew a little bit about, and the more I started looking at telling a story that paralleled um, what went on in 9-11 and, and looking at the personal story of these people's lives, it became clear that I had to really read about math. So... Uh, <laughs> I okay. did a lot of research on uh, <laughs> Boolean mathematics. and. Was it technical? Um, in many ways, the play doesn't get into a lot of the technical elements of, of, of math, but it covers the, the premise of how a mathematician looks at probability. Yeah. And, and so, That's what I was thinking yeah. when you were talking. Yeah. <laughs> the other, I think maybe we answered this question yeah. about what you want the audience to take away, yeah. but um, what was in your mind for the audience to... to See yeah, and understand. For me, it's it's really a matter of it. It's a it's a play in which, you know, this kind of theater I think my, I believe in is a kind of play that you can't be indifferent to. You either there are people who are so passionate about this play when they see it, and some people are shocked by it. But what's interesting to me is is not the shock value, but to allow an audience to consider um, how they could be these people in this be put in their in that place. situation, and how something seems so simple when two people meet. That you find that that they have a lifetime of circumstances that led to this day, um, but that has to do a lot with open-mindedness, doesn't it? Absolutely, which a mathematician might not have. And and the, the character I play does not have that. And the play is about his slow understanding emotionally, moving from his head to his heart, about what life is about. And for her, it's the opposite. It's figuring she works from her heart and to figure out yeah. how things have value when she looks at it from, a, from, a, from an intellectual point of view. So. That's, how, that's how we are. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's what we have to learn yeah. um, the rest of our lives, to open up a little bit yeah, more. Uh, right. Well, thank you so much absolutely. for coming. It was great having you. And we'll be right back with Gerald and Candela. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here with photographer, artist, Gerald Incandela, who was born in Tunisia. He currently lives in Santa Barbara, but spends a lot of time in New York, so we'll have to find out what all this movement is about. You've seen his work in museums and galleries around the world, and his latest work um, is, is uh, about portraits, horses, figures, and it's at the Edward Chella Gallery in Los Angeles. I'll bet you put a label on your work. What do you call it? I don't know what to call it. This time I called them photo drawings. Oh, photo drawings. I used to, my gallery in London was Robert Fraser, and he used to call them photo images. But somehow now I feel the drawing element has gotten stronger and changed it to drawing instead of 
I saw brush strokes, lots mm -hmm. of brush strokes in your work. This Not so piece, much here. This is early. Mm -hmm. What does it say? This is 1990. 1990? Uh, oh no, 80, 80. 1980. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about this before we go into your history. This is when the factory was closing on Union Square. Andy I, Warhol's factory. Yeah, Andy Warhol's factory. I called, I think, Fred Hughes and said, can I come and take some pictures before you move out? And uh, they said, sure. And um, I was I had in mind photographing some interiors. With, uh, I was kind of nostalgic about the place going. And, but then I found the only picture I kept really was this box of dollar paintings, which I call Petty Cash. He did. Petty Cash is a great thing yeah. because that is something that Andy would have used as Petty yeah, Cash. I think so. I think so. And it's great. <laughs> I don't think that he way. thought that, but that is fantastic. Yeah, no, I think it's great that he used them that way. Uh, so, uh, and then is it is it silk screen? Onto no, this the is a photographic paper. It's a pure photograph, pure black and white photographic print. But I use a light during the printing, which changes the color in some areas. So the, it's not tinted. It's just uh, you move light. the light around. I move the light. I fix some areas. I put a light in some other areas, and it change color of the paper, and then fix it and. I try to get colors out of black and white printing with pure black and white you printing. You work only in black and white? Only in black and white. But but it does have different qualities. I can see depth and, and different, yeah. just like you're saying, different colors on the screen. That is by introducing light during the printing. But, ah, and, uh, but it's very important to know that uh, I don't tint, I don't add, it's not mixed media, it's just pure black and white printing. Where did you study, Gerard? I didn't. Gerard? Oh. I don't believe in studying photography, but I studied drawing. And where was that? At the New York Studio School in uh, New York uh -huh. on 8th Street and at Parsons at the MFA Painting Department. Did you grow up in Tunisia? I did until the age of 17. Oh, so you, were, so you went to school in, in Tunis? Yeah, to the Lycée, French Lycée, yeah. It's this very small city. Yeah. Smallish, yeah. Well, smallish. of course, small. The more you grow up, the smaller it gets. <laughs> but uh, it did become very small. At 17, it was over. And, and at that point, were you going to be an artist? No. I didn't know what I was going to do. I thought at the time I would die before I was 30. <laughs> but I think that probably every youth thinks that. What kind of camera do you use? I use a Nikomat, which is an old Nikon uh, when you don't have to worry about film, right? Because you do your own processing? Oh, uh, no, I, it's black and white film. It I is mean, film. I do use film. I don't do, none of those are digital. Uh, uh, do you use digital at all? No, just for snapshots on holidays. But and, can you still get film? You can, actually. I know people think that it's over, but paper. I mean, I think film is important, mm -hmm. <laughs> but people are so, so different about it now. Paper is starting to disappear slowly. Oh, the paper. Paper is more a problem. Oh, we didn't think about that. Mm -mm. And especially with you, you do all your own processing, so we don't have to worry about, we don't have to think about what processing lab will do something, because you do it. I do it myself. But yeah. the paper is the mm -hmm. thing. Can you do it on any kind of paper then? Well, if I think when, paint? when they'll discontinue completely paper, I'll have to coat my paper uh. and print on the paper. So how do you get the, this effect? Light? Yeah, light and brushes. And brush. Well, because when do you use the brushes? After or during? During. Usually in a photograph, one exposes the photograph to a... I'm going to show this. One puts a photograph in... Uh, expose it to the enlarger, and then usually you put the photograph in a tray, and everything appears. And what is this image? Those are horses. Uh, we can see here the, one of the legs, another leg there. And uh, this was from my previous show. I had been pretty quiet uh, production-wise for a while. I hadn't done any, I hadn't been in the dark room for a few years. And all of a sudden I was ready to go back. And I wanted to go back with a lot of movement and I chose horses. Oh, because the movement is great. Yeah, all of a sudden it was like coming back to life and having a lot of movement and but the horses I had photographed for years, five, and, six years. And this, is this like part of the, is this a brush stroke? That's a brush stroke. 
and I'm and, and as I did that, I felt the paper, and it's photographic paper. Yeah, it, it looks is. like canvas or yeah. pa or art paper. Mm -hmm. No, it's pure. Uh, it's just black and white photographic paper. And, and so, where did you get the images of the horses? Oh, I went to Spain. I went to major horse horse farms in uh, a bit everywhere. I like Andalusian horses. And who were your influences when you started doing this? Well, for the horses, it was probably expressionism in general, some kind of gestural, whoever, the, more than people, it's just movement or approach to painting, some, something between uh, gestural painting and expressionist painting. But were you ever um, um, doing these things for films? Because I know you, you had a relationship with Derek Jarman, yeah. who was a great filmmaker. Right. So does this kind of come out of that process? No, I did uh, <coughs> when uh, Derek was doing Caravaggio movie. Thames and Hudson commissioned me to, do a, to be on the set to take pictures during the shoot. Oh. There was a still photographer for the publicity and all this stuff, but I was just there to... What, take whatever I wanted. Were they going to make a book? And they made a book. They yeah. did make a book. I should have brought a book to show you. And the book is just on the set. Just on the set. And I did use brush mark in some of the pictures. Some of the photographs are straight. They didn't need anything. And some are more gestural. Was, where was that, that film? It was shot in London. It was shot in London. Were you, you were very close to Derek. Were I you was. like a sitter, a muse? Yeah, and I you was, were young. Uh, I met uh, Derek in London, in Rome. Yeah, in Rome. I and uh, <coughs> he said, "Oh, you should come to London with me." So I said, "Okay." Yeah, at that time in the seventies, you, you go. Yeah, <laughs> you go. <laughs> and I just stayed. I arrived in London, and I loved it, and stayed. And the relationship? Did you continue to work with him? We didn't work together. Oh, we you lived did just together. the film. No, no, we lived together. And uh, he gave me my first little camera. I mean, just a cheap little camera. Oh, but so that was a big influence then in your life. Well, he, he saw that I had an eye. And, uh -huh. uh, and I, hate, I, mean, I hate to say it myself, but <laughs> he uh, encouraged me and showed my work to other people. He's the one who sent Sam Wagstaff to see my work. So Sam Wagstaff, tell us, he's a, he is the dean of photography. Tell yeah. us a little bit about him. Well, great character. I mean, I think a lot has been said about and, uh, but he could look at anything. He had a wonderful eye. It's, uh, he was somebody who could appreciate a street corner just in a building the way the bricks were laid to a fantastic painting. Uh, Did you live with him? No, no. Oh, you just, he was like a patron then to you. Yeah, he was a friend, patron. We did the book together. He did this book of oh. photographs. He also did uh, Maplethorpe photographs. Yes. Uh, I mean, he was well, he big, was a patron of He was the big patron, yeah, yeah, wasn't yeah. he? And I didn't want to get in between those two. So I kept, <laughs> a, I just stepped very carefully to not to rock the boat there. The, the work that you're doing at Edward Chella's on Wilshire Boulevard um, is about the figure. Yes. And I have this piece. Mm -hmm. I'm going to hold it up and yeah, tell us I what it is. I love one. the way they're fractured. Tell us yeah. about that style. Well, in this piece, in this new group of photographs, I wanted to have openings in the in every one, pretty much every picture in the show, this is a, the theme which uh, unites them, is that you can go through a leg, an arm, a bench, or it's almost like a gateway. You'll see the next one, which is a gateway, which is a key to read the whole show. Let's, uh, let's show, I'll show that piece right now, because this is, um, this is the gateway, so yeah. it influences the horses well, and the figures. I wanted to be, I, I've put this gate, included this gate in the middle of all those figures, so oh. people look at the figures like gateways oh, also. I see, I see. Like, uh, but the thing that I love about the figures is that you don't know the whole body. Mm -hmm. You have to imagine what the rest of the body looks like. It yeah. engages the viewer. Yeah. 
I like, I think it's, uh, I like the viewer to be a participant in making the picture. By making, I mean, when they look at it, that uh, they continue the lines which are not there. I think it's stimulating for the viewer. When you, w when you worked with, with this set, uh, did you use a model? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, the same model? I used him a couple of times, two, three times. It and is it difficult for you to work with models? With real models, yes. Oh, models, runway models. Yeah, or, that is or very photography difficult. Photography model. Oh, I this see. This was a delivery guy. This guy I came see. to deliver some pipes oh. for the plumber. Ah. And I, he asked me a couple of questions, and then I thought I could ask him a couple of questions, and I said, would you pose for me? And he said, sure. Oh, so why is a model more difficult than somebody who just delivers something to you? Well, because a model is a, tries to be aware of what they are going to look like, and it comes in my way of me taking the picture. I see. Because they would turn around, they smile, they have they a look. preconceived yeah. they have a preconceived idea. They pose. While my models, <laughs> I want them to space out and this is the only direction I give them. I say just Do you shoot in a studio? Yes. Sometimes outside too on horses and but I like them to get into their own private world, kind of daydreaming. And I find it much more uh, much more intimate, you know, when you catch somebody uh, lost in their thoughts, I find it very, well, very intimate. That yeah, that's good for you. One of the, before we leave, one of the stories is when uh, Weston Neff, who was the, mm -hmm. at the Getty, um, showed your work, and you had met David Hockney in uh, in Paris, I guess. Yeah. Oh gosh, yes, you know. And the and the collages that David was doing then, they were fantastic. Well, he was doing uh, when I met him. He was just doing Polaroids. He was not oh, doing, doing collages. Oh, he was yeah. doing. Oh, I see. This was because uh, he did some collages of those wonderful he, trees in Paris and little. Yeah. Uh, but this um, came courtyard. after. I mean, this came in the early eighties, I think. Uh huh. When yeah. you were, yeah, that no, came. When I was did you doing this in the late 70s, uh -huh. this kind of work uh, with multiple negatives. Uh, and Weston showed your work? He did when the Getty opened uh, between the Hockney actually and the Warhol, which was really nice. So here we are. We have. <laughs> I know. I know. It's fantastic. The buckle. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're so happy that you were with us today. Well, thank you so much for asking. Thank you for being That's with fun. us. And keep riding to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017. And don't forget to email jaquinn1 at aol.com. Bye.